not the least by any means. Uh, Jeff is essentially the, 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 the person for the internet as far as Asia Pacific is concerned. And I would say probably for a whole lot of the world also. So without further ado, Jeff, over to you for your viewpoint. Thank you for your kind words and uh, thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, over here in Canberra, part of the Deep Space Network, um, <laughs> it's just coming on morning. Uh, but it is indeed a pleasure to be here. So let me talk a little bit about the same topic you've heard so much about already. And what I wanted to start with is what was the brief? And, and this is kind of interesting of what it's not. Because if I want to just talk about the nature and requirements of computer communications network, I'm actually not talking about where computing itself is going. And there is a huge amount of speculation, particularly around have we gone as far as we can with engineering silicon? And at what point do we start to look back at biological systems that have far more flexibility? And interestingly, devolve a lot of the determinism and replace it with semi-coherent chaos as a means of computing. In other words, looking at the wet space of our brains and how they work and understanding how we could devise our own analog of that facility uh, in a more contrived environment, but using the same biological tools. Not talking about that, not going there, going basically down the area of communications itself. And of course, like others, I think there are some sort of guiding thoughts about, well, 50 years, 50 years is such a long time. What if we'd asked the question 50 years ago? And even more importantly, what if we'd asked it 100 years ago? What would we have said in 1921 about public communications requirements? Because if you think about the world at that time, the penny postage stamp had revolutionized the, the latter 19th century. And there was a huge push for literacy, which was as much about the postal system, the ability to communicate, because that's what the postage system needed. The elite service was the telegram, but that wasn't the mass market service. Postage dominated. And then radio telephony development was just picking up the pace. I'm like, yes, uh, the telephone had hit the world in 1876 at the World Exposition, but that sort of understanding the vision was a conversation that happened in the uh, 1910s, really, uh, particularly in America with um, the rise of what became AT&T and uh, Theodore Vail. Um, those seeds of understanding and taking an elite luxury service and turning it into a massively deployed commodity was a conversation in 1921. In the same way that we had rural electrification, we were talking about enlightened service and utility operators that saw universal service as their vision. What would we have missed if we talked in 1921? Well, you know, the facts, <laughs> which interestingly rose and fell across those 100 years. It rose to the extent that it was the dominant international telephone uh, use for over a decade in the 1970s, and then it fell. Uh, we would have missed television, would not have conceived its popularity. Um, it's hard to imagine in 1921 what we thought about computers, um, excessively hard. We just almost in the area of beyond science fiction. And certainly this embracing digital environment completely missed it. So whatever we were pro prognosticated, I suspect we would have tried a more efficient postal delivery system as being the 50 year target. Interesting. What about 50 years back, 1971? Now we just landed on the moon, something that in 1921 would never have been predicted as possible in a mere 50 years. That first 50 years, I think, of the 20th century, 21 to 71, was totally revolutionary in so many ways. Uh, but even so, when we talk about 1971 and think about what was going on, um, Unix had just been developed. And this whole idea that computing was becoming so abundant, I didn't need to share. And like the name said it all. 
It was a me version of Multics. There's no one else on this system. It's my computer. Now, it may have only been a PDP-7 and so on and so forth, but this idea of exploiting abundance and exploiting Moore's law, which was kicking in at the time, because while we were still building bigger and better mainframes, mini computing was gathering momentum. So what should have we seen in 71? And did we catch it? Well, one of the huge themes was the transformation of computers into a consumer product. And, and that would have taken a massive leap of faith that applications could become popular in the same way that radio and television was popular. And, and I'm pretty sure that would have required an awesome degree uh, of uh, imagination to see the rise and rise and rise of Apple. And interestingly, the conversation of why Apple worked, but the MSI 8080 died an ignominious death. History. Um, but there was another transformation as well. This whole issue of the role of data and its transformation into information, adding computation to data that turned it into a useful asset. Now, inside all of those changes that were kind of gathering pace in 1971, there was one thing we were still completely stuck in, and, and that is the lens that we used for communication. The only artifacts we had, telegraphy, telephony, the telephone network, you know, the postal network, and so on, we thought of communications as a telephone network for computers. And it was one of those things that there was a big debate at that time, right there and then, as packet networking was being developed from the early work in the 1960s. And the big debate, which was almost irreconcilable in 1971, was whether these packets that we were talking about, which seemed about right for computers, whether they were individual quanta of data that travel the network alone and without context, or they were simply a quanta of encoding and that they traveled along these network railway tracks, virtual circuits, and had no independent forwarding existence. That was a massive thought. And it was so antithetical, the packet networking as a quanta of data in its own way. It was so an antithetical to the telephone network that the folk at DARPA were just loony dreamers that was never going to scale. It was never going to be the way the telephone companies built the next generation of networking for computers because they had the money, they had the wherewithal, they had the power in, the, in that world, and they determined that role. And so we got clouded by what existed, and that really constrained our thoughts about what could exist because of your, the tyranny of the present actually influencing our dreams of the future. So before we kind of go further, let's just quickly recap the last 50 years. <coughs> Excuse me, it's hard to find a picture of a Vax 11780 these days. By God, they were everywhere, weren't they? Um, and oddly enough, it was these kinds of machines, that sort of hybrid mainframe mini that dominated the environment. The network was just a transmission fabric for computers. The network itself was relatively dumb. It was just a packet transmission facility. Every other function was oddly enough at the edge, at the mainframe computers. So whether it was the DNS, whether it was actually routing, dedicated routers were an afterthought. We used to actually just run forwarding programs inside VAXs or whatever you had to have to hand. Very simple. This was just computers and a tra packet transmission facility. Now, by the time we developed this model of the internet standalone and shifted across, because quite frankly, the computing industry had gone into PCs. They'd actually made this into a commercial consumer commodity item. We then started to figure out how to build a network around this. And what we couldn't do is do the same as we'd done with mainframes, turn the mainframe into this you know, multiple user, multiple thing that was both client and server. Personal computers, we condemned to the life of a client. And we started making a distinction between the customers who were clients and the computers and the networking who were at the other end, 
who were the services that oddly enough we called the network and so customers out there on their pcs didn't run the dns as a service uh, we pulled all that naming system into the network routing we pulled into the network all the messaging content and service richness was pulled into the network because out at the edge were just pcs and they were good for very little other than being a television that looked at what the servers did over on the other side of the barrier and so one of the big things we did in the 1990s was take the original internet model a peer-to-peer -peer network of mainframes and turned it into an asymmetric client server network that's the internet architecture and it was built way way back at modem time and hasn't changed one iota why is v6 a failure because peer-to-peer -peer networking is such a 1970s concept it just never struck a chord by the 1990s and trying to get folk to run a 1970s architecture this year 2021 is proving to be impossible who would have thought you know obvious um what happened in 2000 well we started perfecting the client server model because the inside of the internet the exchanges and peering points and gateways we started making that kind of a thing and an own point of investment and this whole interconnection fabric we organized the expenditure and we actually tiered ourselves up to try and figure out in a basic tiering network no one could figure who was the customer and who was the provider but if some folk came along and said i'm tier one everyone pay me interestingly it worked you know everyone else started to pay them um, and we started to invent this sort of segmented internet of layered structure and we talked about transit and traffic engineering we talked about quality of service why we talked about quality of service because quite frankly the demand overhung the capacity we were still into rationing we were still building a network that was actually insufficient and folk wanted more more than other folk could get and this is why this whole issue of trying to produce quality of service engineering which was just another dumb form of rationing uh, ultimately the real answer was as many folk pointed out at the time and still continue to point out if you're rationing just get more just get more until you overwhelm demand at that point you've achieved but at the same time as there was segmentation and specialization inside the network there was also this degree of segmentation at the edges and so the clients and their client feeder systems became customer access networks and then we had the rise of content distribution networks that was all in play when apple introduced the iphone and mobility changed everything just literally everything because once you bring up an edge that is permissionless i don't need to wait six months for a tech to visit my house to string some copper conductor up to turn on my iphone i don't need to consult almost anyone and at some point we might even get rid of this ridiculous sim model of, of, of the leash of the carrier and actually just turn on a device get it to self-sense and self-connect at some point we'll get rid of the last vestige of that telephony control model that i was so enamored with in the 80s and finally kick them out and get rid of them because we never needed them and we never do mobility changed everything in the way we thought about edges volume massive volume and so we are where we are today and it's interesting to think about the generations of networking from serial lines all the way through to what we build today with various forms of broadcast narrowcast um, fiber to here and there etc and, and the kinds of layered media technologies and encoding we're using and the question really arises, well, weren't they all different networks? And the answer was, yes, of course they are. Why did the internet work in 1971? Well, the internet wasn't a layered link technology. The true genius of the internet was to actually separate out how to get whatever it was you were moving, bits from A to B, from how to organize those bits that once they got to the other end, they were understandable as part of a context of a service transaction. Now, why does that matter? Because every time up until then, we invented something, we needed an entirely new network and an application infrastructure to do it. Ethernet was chaotic for the industry, totally chaotic. 
because not only did you need new NIC cards in all your mainframes and that, but you actually started writing different applications to work on internet because you wanted to take advantage of the speed, the characteristics of ethernet as distinct from what you were doing before. Every new comms technology created a new application set of technologies. No wonder the industry tried to resist change because change was expensive. The internet preserved the value of investment because I could train folk in the internet and it didn't matter what comms technology came along. And so, yes, it's still much the same internet as 1971 in that respect. In actual fact, with TCP, it's probably the same internet of 81, but that's just details. The issue is it's a preservation of the intellectual investment in layering it out and keeping them independent, which was the genius of the internet, as distinct from what everyone talked about in OSI. You know, this was the reason why we all did it. So from that point, I think we're now up to this question of, well, the next 50 years, you know, and the issue is, I think, even in looking at 1921 and 1971, the dominant factors that would drive the next 50 years was actually there at the time. It's just we didn't quite realize their significance amongst all the other factors. Radio was around in 1921. Even a lot of the technologies of computing that we do today was certainly there in 71. And this whole issue of getting it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till even a computer in a watch looks disgustingly large. You know, it was there in amongst all the other factors. It just wasn't clearly dominant to the folk at the time. So rather than trying to figure out what's dominant in our communications needs over the next 50 years, let's just think about what the common drivers are for this sector of activity. So what drives change? What are the factors that cause us to invest more, to build more? Um, it was always said the internet, unlike the telephone network, had no idea of what its use model was. And so it was a use model for everything. But once you say that, and you realize that as humans, we live to communicate, and you've got a mechanism that can allow anything to happen on it, which is what the, the computing communication network is, then quite frankly, demand seems to overhang supply as simply an axiom of networking. And so a lot of the work we've been doing has actually been in scaling. As Mike O'Dell said uh, from Bell Labs, and I think it was about 30 odd years ago, there's only one problem on the internet. All the other things are just byproducts of the one problem. The one problem is scaling, how to make it bigger. And we've grown by a factor of 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 over even the last 30 years. The systems that we use, whether it's routing, whether it's the DNS, whether it's packet transmission, they're all billion or billions of times bigger. And it's actually a fundamental testament to the resilience of the technology that we haven't changed a lot of the fundamentals of the internet. We've just turned up the scaling knob by a factor of 10 to the nine. And we continue to turn it up. You know, this whole issue of photonic amplifiers, wavelengths, multiplexing, various forms of phase amplitude and polarization modulation. We can talk about 300 terabit fiber cables being laid in the next year, and we're not joking. We can talk about petabit, and we're not joking. So the amount of transmission capacity we have laying on the seafloor and straddling the globe is now truly, truly awesome. And we continue to build more. So across this, we're moving more data, serving content, service transactions. It just continues to this inexorable rise. And what we're doing is placing enormous amounts of stress on the way we deliver. And so somehow we need aggregation in both server and content because all that demand can't be serviced by a poor old single computer in somebody's basement. That's just 1980s thinking. To service acute load, you need to distribute where you deliver from. Clearly obvious for almost any mechanism of service delivery uh, known for centuries. And, and last but not least, if you really wanted to understand scaling, understand mobility, because that's the point where almost every single device out there is actually these days mobile. The tethered wired internet as a consumer product is decreasingly relevant as folk want this stuff with them all the time. And so, What's the result of that? The network 
is increasingly being marginalised as instrumental in service delivery. We serve from the edge, but many folk have already observed that. Serving for the edge actually gives you the next thing too, because people are impatient and we want this stuff faster. Human perception, particularly in conversation, the telephone networks had figured out that it was 300 milliseconds. Once you got the layover that, you started talking over each other. The natural gap in human conversation, when I stop and you start, is perceived as 300 milliseconds. What's the natural gap for computers? Whoa, as fast as you can possibly make it. How fast should networks be? How responsive? Well, they should anticipate. How do they anticipate? By being ever faster. And so we obsess on milliseconds. We're thinking about nanoseconds. And this whole issue of moving to the edge gets rid of a huge amount of the laws of physics about the delays in pushing packets around the globe. And so the other accidental part of this was it's faster because as we distribute the load, we actually get it closer to the customer. Almost everything that you do on the internet comes from your edge, not my edge. And everything I do comes from my edge on my continent and not yours. And that's basically fast, incredibly fast. So if you think about food miles, which was popular at some point about you know, how far did your food travel to your plate? In our industry, think about packet miles because packet miles is shrinking like crazy. And the more we put capacity up in the air with you know, 4G and 5G systems, those last mile systems are now at gigabit and applications are being re-engineered to meet, it, meet that. And so what we've got is compressed interactions, round trips matter across shorter in distances using higher capacity. All of that just means it's fast and it's better. Why? Because as we can put more computing at the edge, we can do way, way more with what we see. Encryption is now ubiquitous. Almost no one runs HTTP on port 80. Uh, it's all encrypted. We're sealing up the last of these portholes with TLS 1.3, the SNI field. And we're now moving into what we'd call oblivious services that isolate knowledge of the end client, even from the server, let alone in the middle. And those techniques are now becoming mainstream. Oddly enough, there's that content application and platform sectors are all taking the privacy agenda up with an absolute enthusiasm. Every release from Apple has more. Every release from Android has more. Every version of your browser has more. And so the whole question about whether networks are trustable or not doesn't matter. No one trusts them. And so all network infrastructure is uniformly treated as simply untrustable. All of these things combined make it cheaper. Electricity in the 1910s was a luxury good that to wire your house, put the generators in the basement, required not just a middle class income, it required very much an exclusive income to the privileged few. By massive deployment, by deploying the infrastructure everywhere, we made electricity an affordable commodity for literally everyone. We're doing the same here. We're living in a world that's, while Moore's law keeps on tottering on, we might be in our last days of it, but we're still in a world of abundant comms and computing. We're still making the chip, the chip fab factories get ever smaller so far. And certainly there's these massive economies of scale. And most of it's free. I'm like, this is the unbelievable part of this. You do a search and in 10 milliseconds, you will find an answer that would have taken a room full of researchers and a budget of tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot more faulty response. You get that instantly and you never paid. And so cheap means free. How do we do that? Well, we capitalized my future spending profile and yours. We created a surveillance economy which is unparalleled in this world. And we capitalized a collective asset that unleashed a level of economic power that has created this transformational ability. And oddly enough, like it or not, 
this surveillance economy has now made what could have been only thought of as a luxury service into something that every single one of us take for granted, an affordable mass market commodity. Cheaper will continue as a huge driver. So those four factors, bigger, faster, better, cheaper, four. Um, those four factors seem to me to be the seeds of direction because we're gonna strive that way because that's this virtuous circle of if you make it better, if you make it faster, if you make it cheaper, if you, you know, make it work for folk, demand will increase, production will increase, and off we go. And that's going to drive it. So, you know, this is all fantastic. This is, you know, the Candide, the Voltaire view. Of it's the best of all possible worlds, isn't it? It's all good, right? Well, I'm not sure that it's all good. And if you think about the fact that our societies are based on the way we communicate, there are some awfully big changes coming about. And the last time we tried it in the Industrial Revolution, we tried it with printing presses. Every single time we've changed the technologies and the way in which societies communicate, we unleash forces which at best are catastrophic, which at worst kill millions of us. And certainly that's the darker side of revolution and we're in the middle of another. And this is not going to be pretty because it never has been. And I'm not sure we're going to avoid it this time. But let me move out from society and talk a little bit about the comms area in particular, because that was the brief. And when I talk about that brief, I kind of think, you know, we've been obsessive about IPv whatever. V4 to V6 is, is, is uniform, unique addressing even relevant anymore? Is this a transition that is never going to end because it doesn't matter? These are just battles of 1980s or even 1970s technologies. Who cares? Addressing's over. Doesn't matter. Naming and namespaces? Is the DNS important? Is this single idea of a lingua franca of the internet, the DNS, actually important anymore? Is names, are names, a human use thing or a computer rendezvous mechanism? Well, it's the latter. There's only so many humans. There's only so many things we can do. But gee whiz, there's an awful lot of devices out there that need the same rendezvous functions. And so in some ways, we have to think about names differently, attributes of service, and think about this in a referential frame, framework. Because it's all about densely replicated services these days. And the client, human or computer, is trying to rendezvous with what something might judge as the best service point. Something that's fast, something that's cheap, something that's secure, something that's resilient. Now, do I need to work this out? Oh, don't leave it up to me. I'm not able to do that. Does the network need to work it out? No. Keep the network dumb. Who works it out? Well, the service needs to work itself out. These referential frameworks are an attribute of the service, not of the network. And you start to think of the nature of network transactions. We're still building telephone networks. A talks to B. It's TCP again and again and again. Why? A talks to B in some pseudo relaxed form of synchronization. I send, you send, I act, you act, you know. Is this really where we should be? How far do we dream before we get to models that relate more to the neural systems of semi-coherent chaos where somehow coherent thoughts emerge from the electrical noise inside our skulls. Why don't we build networks like that? Humans seem to be able to do it. In a couple of years from one cell into billions, why can't we do it with our systems, our networking systems? Interesting. Longer term trends. Um, geez, we're pushing everything out of the network over to the edge, that's obvious. Uh, transmission is just abundant, that's obvious. Sharing technologies, time multiplexing, packet multiplexing. Eh, Google has its own wires. Facebook has its own, you know, conductor guides. Sharing technology just doesn't matter anymore. Oddly enough, we're back to the early days of telephony. One subscriber, one wire on a pole. Uh, one subscriber, one system, one set of services, awfully close to the endpoint. And while it might be tomorrow, 50 years is a long time. 
So we're no longer using a network and using computing to bring the consumers to the service, shifting the services out towards the consumers of that service. And the network is really a replication factory, not a transmission factory. And so now the application is actually everything. The application is the service. It's not a window to somewhere else. It is the somewhere else. This world, even today, is an application-centric world. It's not a platform-centric world. It's not a network-centric world. It's an application-centric world. So what does that mean? Well, we stripped out the role of the telephone networks as the arbiter of communication in our society. 50 years ago, they were the biggest and most significant enterprise in every developed society. They employed the most people. Everyone owed them the most money. The telephone bill was this massive credit organization and they had the most power. In the US, it was difficult to see the difference between the US Department of State and AT&T's commercial position with regards to international telephony. In fact, international politics. Why? Because they were the driving enterprise of our societies. They were the center of everything because communication matters. And from that point of view, the network mattered. We're now coming around to the fact the network just doesn't matter. And this whole issue of new networks and new IP is kind of a nostalgia, trying to think that once again, the network will become important. It won't. We have commoditized it to the point where this is just dumb, dumb, um, dumb guides, dumb wavelength guides. It just doesn't matter anymore. And so if the network is not the internet and the network doesn't matter, what is the internet now? Where are we driving with this? Because we're used to say, well, it's a common network, is a common protocol and a common protocol address pool. That's the internet. You're on the internet if you have the right IP address. Well, no. Is it the DNS? Well, no. So what is it? I would actually argue that it's just a disparate, very loosely organized set of services. And the only thing they share is common referential mechanisms. And that's not networking at all, per se. It's not the way we used to think about it. What we need to think about is where are we going with common referential mechanisms? How can I communicate with you, whether I'm a computer or a human and you're a computer, it doesn't matter. How do I transmit that concept? I need to refer you. I need to be able to exchange a reference to something. And it's that bit that I think is the key of where we're going to continue down this road of abstraction where we're going to continue to marginalize the bottlenecks that used to exist and to take out their power and control and replace it with a new locus of power and control. And that where we see currently the rise and rise of CDNs, we're going to keep on moving on. And it's not with a better CDN, it's with a model of reference and service that works around the CDN and goes even better even faster, even cheaper, and even bigger. Thank you very much.